you program program now people can be programmed now I give you my experience how people can be programmed and how they can be reprogrammed i happen to work for jews i'm not standing here before you because the jews are paying me <laughs> wallah no jews pays me anything i happen to work for jews in a furniture shop as a dispatch clerk one day my boss calls me he says did that no that's no that's that's how he is did that i was a dispatch clerk that was the highest a black man could reach in the establishment but it was very low compared to the the white workers that position of mine very low but the highest that a black man can reach in the in that apartheid system white system in south africa highest i could reach so the deal that i have a jewish couple from the argentina i would like to take them to the indian area like the kasba you know the indian area and give them some indian food what would you suggest so i said you see mr beer that's his name beer brothers is a very big firm there are over 125 establishment in south africa at the present moment a multi million dollar or run establishment so i said look the only thing i can think of is there is a hotel here in durban called goodwill lounge but uh, i mean suitable for the whites to go But I said the only thing Indian about this lounge is the curry powder they put into the curry. Otherwise, it's just like any other Western restaurant. But I said, why don't you come to my house, and I will give you what we eat, and I'll play some Indian music in the background, you know, while you're eating. <laughs> so give you that Indian atmosphere. Then I'll take you to the mosque, and you'll watch the Muslim at prayer, and perhaps that will give you an idea of the Indians in Durban, your your visitors. says did that is a very good idea but i'll have to confirm it with my wife you know the western i can't do anything without consulting his wife this is quite all right quite all right next morning he calls me again he says did that my wife is agreeable and he took out 3 pounds it was a lot of money it was a lot of money those days he took out 3 pounds and he gave it to me i said no no it's quite all right so you know i can afford i said no no did that did help you it was a great help no it was a great no no you don't know 19 around 1950 3 pounds was a lot of money it was a lot of money so we made an appointment it says 8 o'clock or certain time like that i said you come along to this place in queen street durban in the center of the town and i'll be waiting for you so he came mr and mrs beer mr and mrs uh, daniels of a manufacturing firm in durban and this couple from the argentina six three pairs husband and wife husband and wife husband and wife so i welcomed them took them home and we sat down to eat and little chit chat uh, said this sir uh, is the unleavened bread of the jews our roti unleavened bread unleavened means without yeast unleavened bread of the jews and they enjoyed the food as soon as we finished eating i was about about 200 meters away from the juma masjid the largest mos- mosque in the southern hemisphere my residence so we could hear the azan the isha so I'm, we are listening to the azan the mas i say you hear somebody calling sir i said yes you know what he's saying he says no he says saying bismillah so allahu akbar allahu akbar he's saying allah is the greatest allah is the greatest he repeats it four times he continues the muazzin continues says ashhadu an la ilaha illallah said i bear witness that there is no other object to worship but allah he is the only one who deserves to be worshiped So I shall do Anna Muhammad Rasulullah said I bear witness I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah I said if you accept these two fundamentals that there is but one God and Muhammad is his messenger what is the message so hayya ala salat is has come to prayer hayya ala salat is has come to prayer hayya ala al falah is has come to success because this is real success if you want to be successful there is no other way that you hearken to the commandments of god and be charitable to your fellow human beings then he winds up the call by saying allahu akbar allahu akbar allah is still the greatest allah is still the greatest whether you come or you don't come you will not going to lower him in his exaltation in his majesty in his glory he still remains supreme and the final words of warning 
the muazzin gives is la ilaha illallah that there is no other object of worship but allah you can keep on worshiping your man gods your women gods your money gods but remember this that the only one who deserves to be worshiped is him this is the national anthem of the muslims wherever they live and when a muslim hears it he can hearken to the call he does not have to ask who is ringing the bell is an rc or a drc in my country it means rc means roman catholic and drc means the dutch reformed church you don't have to ask who is ringing the bell you hearken to the call and you respond and the azan also got finished side by side with my explanation the azan concluded so i'm suggesting mr beer if you like we can go down and watch the muslim at prayer i had already offered him that he said will we be allowed to do that i said yes sir you know my people are very happy and wallah my people in south africa when we get visitors we are very happy there are some countries in the muslim world they don't allow visitors you know keep them out hey they can see through the window look no no the muslims you know who are doing that kind of thing treatment when our nabi karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam that christian deputation from najran he accommodated them in the masjid al nabawi in the masjid of the prophet Three days and three nights. They slept there. They ate there, and they had a dialogue for three days and three nights. And when Sunday happened to come by during this period, he offered the masjid the Nabawi for the Christians to offer the prayers. This is how tolerant he was. But we won't allow the non-Muslim to come near the house of Allah. There are people. The best place. The best place for talking about Islam is the masjid. Open your masjids, man. Let them come. have them seated at the back let them watch and when they watch the muslim at prayer and when they go into the sujood you don't know what happens to them the impact that that sujood has upon the people they see nothing there no idols no images no pictures nothing in the man falling down to the ground i'll tell you something more i'll tell you about this so i said no no you'll be allowed so i take them all six of them to the masjid please take off your shoes here it's a type of inconvenience but they say well they see something nice and funny this is a general impression in the masjid they don't know what the masjid is what the mosque is they don't know the difference between a mosque and a temple generally they don't know we think we assume that they know everything they know nothing please take off your shoes they started taking off the shoes so i said you know why you take off your shoes sir he says no i said you remember when moses was on mount sinai god spoke to him and he said draw not nigh hither put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where understandest is holy ground i say in respect of that commandment we muslims we take off our shoes before we go in for prayer we make ablution wudu all the exposed parts of the body are being washed the hands the feet the nostrils the nape of the neck gargling them out brushing the teeth i said this the muslim does five times a day every day of the year the one who's particular with his prayers and purely from the hygienic point of view no one is going to find fault with the person who washes himself five times a day it's a good hygienic practice and everybody agrees it's a good hygienic practice secondly it serves certain psychological purposes we are washing not because we are dirty we just had a shower this morning no we are washing because we're going to meet our lord we're going to stand before him so mentally it's preparing us for prayer and thirdly this is also another commandment given by god almighty to the holy prophet moses in the book of exodus that is the second book of the bible it says and moses and aaron and their sons washed their hands and their feet there at when they went into the tent of the congregation they washed as the lord commanded moses so we muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment though we haven't got the label of a jew nor yet that of a christian yet in all humility we claim that we are more jewish than the jews and more christians than the christians in this that we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets in the house of prayer sit down sir, right at the back had them seated and the salat takes place and we see going to different postures allahu akbar so what is what is all this you people doing mm, allah i said no this is to signify that we divorce ourselves from earth, all earthly things and we will solely contemplate on god so saying we read chapters and verses from the holy quran celebrating the praises of god and we go into different postures and in every posture we celebrate his praises in the ruku what you say subhana rabbil azim subhana rabbil azim subhana rabbil azim glory to god the great glory to god the great glory to god from there we are rising samiyallahu liman hamida allah listens to the one that praises him we have the assurance 
assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular veins, as the Holy Quran testifies, it says, We are indeed closer to you than your very life veins. If He is that close to us, then we do not have to shout on the top of our voices, wanting a deaf God to hear, because He listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and with that assurance we arise. And from this position, it's Allah Akbar, and we go into the sujood. And they see the people going to the sujood. That is the funniest thing that the Westerner sees in the mosque. Funniest. To them it's funny. Silly. Putting the heads down, putting the bumps up. <laughs> you say, what a way to pray. <laughs> no, no, it goes. The thoughts, if you were not Muslim, the same thoughts will go through your mind. What is this guy doing? Huh? Putting the head down, putting the bumps up. This is the way to pray. <laughs> no, this is human mind. The human mind works that way. Brothers, sisters, that's how it works. <laughs> So when the guy goes, in, anybody goes into the studio, he says, you see, sir, that is how Jesus prayed. To these people, I said, this is how all the prophets pray. All, I said, all. I said, sounds like a sweeping generalization, but it is not so. If you have been reading your own holy scriptures, you will be able to confirm what I'm going to quote you now. And I'll quote you from your own book. It says, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And again... And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, and Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we read that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went there, he went to the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and he said, wait and watch, look out, be careful, be on guard. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. Now we are asking, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Can a circus acrobat do any better than that? No, no, when you say, how does a man, and Abraham, and Moses, and Aaron, and Joshua, and Jesus, and Muhammad, they all fell on their faces and prayed. How does a man fall on his face and pray, except the way we Muslims do? Man, you can teach the guy without creating offense. We have a saying, okay, you can kill the snake without breaking the stick. You can teach without creating offense. Hmm, fascinated, fascinated. The Salat they witness, and they come back home. You sit down for tea and some samosas. Now, I start with them, again, with my boss. I said, excuse me, sir, have you seen the Quran? He says, no, do that. So, would you like to have a look at it, sir? He said, have you got an English translation? I said, yes, sir. He says, no, I don't mind. So, I had this same Quran, but in three volumes. Originally published in India, Pakistan, cheap paper, so it had become very bulky, so I had to make it in three volumes. Ten, ten, ten separas. We call it separas, juice. So I took this Quran out. Between one couple, I gave one volume. Between the second couple, I gave another volume. And to my boss, I gave him the last volume. It has an index. So I deliberately gave him the last volume. So they all started opening, seeing inside. What's, what does it look like? What's... So I'm suggesting to my boss, I said, excuse me, sir, you see at the ba back of that volume you have, there's an index. Look up the subject, Moses. So he opened the index, Moses, Moses, there are dozens of references about Moses, everything that you want to know, man, in the index. Jesus, everything about Jesus. What do you want to know? In this Quran, everything on your fingertips. So he found Moses. I said, sir, if you want to check up actually what it says, you know, these are the headings. Have a look, see what it says. So he opened somewhere, he opened somewhere else. Then he looks at me. He says, did that? This book is very funny. <laughs> so what's funny about it, sir? What's funny about it, sir? He said, no, you see, this book seems to be speaking in our favor. But you people are all against us, you Muslims. <laughs> you know, he has been reading about Musa -Salam and Firon in the confrontation with the Egyptians. The Egyptians set hard pass for these people, made them to make bricks without straw, and they killed their sons and kept their daughters alive. And that was also a bitter, severe trial, keeping your daughters alive. And as they are growing, you know, the Egyptians are watching, your daughters growing up, 12, 14, developing, mm -hmm, is making his mouth water. You know, he's going to use them. These Egyptians, they did terrible, cruel things. I said, no, that is true, sir. You see, sir, 
your people were a god fearing people do you believe in god the egyptians were mushriks they were idolatrous people and they said hard task for you people injustice is committed against you so god tells us so objectively that look these people were wrong the egyptians were wrong and allah saved these jews from the egyptian bondage right but today sir i said you see the position is different you see you have you served our lands you stole our lands so did that how can you say that <laughs> palestine belongs to us palestine belongs to us i said how sir how sir how he said no god promised it to us i said where sir oh he knew his bible he is a businessman but he knew his bible he said in the book of genesis chapter 17 verse 8 god speaks to hazrat ibrahim alayhi salam to the prophet abraham he says i will give unto thee to you and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of canaan palestine for an everlasting possession and i will be the god to see that they have it i'll protect them so god gave it to us he promised it to us that's his title deed that's his title deed to palestine the jews title deed is in the bible and this is what they program the whole western world the christian the americans are all program brainwash so look here here the bible that you own the christians the old testament is the bible of the jews the christians accept it as the word of god So look here, Genesis chapter seventeen verse eight. God gave it to us, and these Arab barbarians they won't allow us to live in peace. Look what they're doing to us. So the simple is a look. They can see the Americans and the British and the French. They can see the the, the, the tyranny and the cruelty of the Jews. But so what can we do, man? You see, God gave it to them, and these barbarians they will not allow these people to live in peace. So. We know it's wrong what they are doing, bulldozing people, breaking their arms. This is not right. But what can we do? This is God's promise. God says, "Give it to them. Let them have it, man." Programming, brainwashing. The whole Western world, the Christian world, is brainwashed. This man here, honestly, says, "Look, did that? This is promised by God to us." So I said, "Mr. Beer, you see in your book, in the book of Deuteronomy." Chapter eighteen, verse twenty-one. God says, "This is the book of Moses, supposed to be his Torah." God says, "That how are you to know whether the thing that is spoken by the prophet is from God or not?" He says. God gives the answer to that. He poses the question and he gives the answer. He says, "If the thing that the prophet says if it does not come to pass, it does not happen. That is the thing the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him." Right? Is that right? Is that a valid test? He said, "Yes." It's a valid test for applying to any prophecy, any basharat, anything that's going to happen in the future. This is a valid test. as given in the bible i said shall we apply this to this prophecy he said yes yes don't it's reasonable we can apply this test so i said you see sir god promises abraham according to you all the land of canaan the whole of palestine for an everlasting possession and he said i will be the god i'll see to it that they are protected the all the land of palestine But I says, you know, sir, when Abraham died, he didn't own one square foot of land, according to your Bible. He was buried on a piece of land that was purchased by his son Ismail and Ishaq. They went to bury the father, but it was he was buried on a purchased piece of land. And the Bible tells us says that when they died, they lived in hopes, not having received the promises. And Abraham didn't own one square foot of land. not enough land to rest his foot upon means not even one square foot of land he owned so if god offered him the whole of palestine and he didn't get one square foot that means that is not the promise of god in the quran we are told wa'dallahu haqq if allah makes a promise his promise is true if this is allah's promise he will fulfill it if it is not he said look wa'dallahu haqq my book tells me and he didn't own one square foot of land so that is not the promise of god <sighs> punctured no is a reasonable man is my boss but is reasonable is punctured but i didn't want to 
cut short the story. I wanted to pursue the matter further. So I said, you see, sir, according to you, you are disqualified. This is not the promise of God. But I am prepared to concede that God did make such a promise. I am prepared to concede as if Palestine was my father's property. I am prepared to give. I am prepared to give away. As if Palestine was my father's property. I said, look, I am prepared to concede that God did make such a promise. Although you are disqualified from your own book, the test. I am prepared to concede. What is the promise? Let's read it. He said, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Who is the seed of Abraham? He said, we the Jews. I said, no doubt you are the seed of Abraham, but are you the only seed? <laughs> In the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, no less than 12 times, no less than 12 times, this God Almighty, in your book, he speaks about Ishmael. He tells Ibrahim al Islam, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I'll make him a great nation, because he is thy seed. He is your seed. And as for Ishmael, thy son, and as for Ishmael, thy seed, no less than twelve times in your Bible, Ishmael is spoken of as the son and seed of Abraham. Then what right have you to deny him that birthright? If your God says in your book, son, as for, as for Ishmael, thy son, as for Ishmael, thy seed, and as for 12 times in your book, the first book of the Bible, has that Ishmael is spoken of as the son and seed of Abraham. What right have you to deny him that? No doubt you are also the seed of Abraham, the Jews. Hazrat Ibrahim a.s. had two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. The Arabs are the children of Ismail a.s. And, Is and the Jews are the children of Hazrat Ishaq a.s. You are all both brothers. You are both the seed of Abraham. Why should you not live in peace and harmony in that country? If it was offered to the seed of Abraham, then both the seeds you should live as brothers. He said, you see, did that. We had this under David and Solomon. You know, we own this place. So, we have taken it back. We just took back what was ours. We had it. Th thousand years before Jesus was born. We had this place. David ruled it. Solomon ruled it. Uh -huh. But I said, how did you get it, sir? You came from Egypt, a slave nation, a unified people, community, and you knocked hells into the Palestinians. The Bible says, in one day, in one day, the Jews killed 30 kings. That means they conquered 30 kingdoms. In one day, Hitler couldn't do any such thing. In one day, 30 kings. What they are talking about is this, this village chief, the king. You call him a king. Well, you conquered him. You're a unified nation, 12 tribes coming together. And this one little villager hmm, killed him. Another villager killed him and took his place to... 30 kingdoms they conquered in one day. 30 kings. It's like childish thing you're talking, man. You know, 30 kingdoms and 30 kings. No. So, I said, now how did you take it? Arms. And by force of arms, if you have a right to possess somebody else's land, then by force of arms, if the Arabs want to take it back, you have no right to complain. What's good for you, What's good for the goose is good for the gander. It should be both equal. If you can take it by force of arms, then if the Arabs are trying to take it away from you by force of arms, you shouldn't complain. But it says, did that. You see, we have it. And possession is nine-tenth of the law. Nine-tenth of the law. Possession is nine-tenth. You got it, man. Now to wrench it, it's yours. But to get it out of his hand, it's a, it's a job. It's a job. Possession is... So we possess it. So I said, look, you had it a thousand years ago. You had this place. We also had Eid, Spain. We Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. If we have the power once more again, can we go and claim Spain? He said, our fathers built the Alhambra. You know, fountains and gardens and shh, monumental buildings. Allah describes it in the... Holy Quran, Kam Tarakum in Jannatim Uyun, how many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazumu Makam in Karim and cornfields and monumental buildings. When Matin Kanu Fiha Fakihin and wealth and the amenities of life, 
in which they took so much delight, all these things left by my forefathers. Have I a right to go and claim it? If you had the power, can you go and claim Spain? Because our fathers had it. He says, no. Can the Dutch go and claim Indonesia once more again? He says, we ruled it for 300 years. He says, no. Can the Portuguese reclaim Mozambique? He says, we ruled it for 500 years. He says, no. Then what right have you to Palestine? <laughs> because your fathers had it, you have a right? You have no right. How did you get it? Hmm. This thing carried on. And at the end, Mr. Beer, my boss, tells me, this is D, Dad, we didn't know that the Arabs had a case. No program from childhood. Palestine belongs to us. And these Arab barbarians, they won't allow us to live in peace. So now they are fighting with a spirit of jihad. This is our land, our possession. God gave it to us. We must protect it. That's programming, programming. You have to reprogram the people. He said, we didn't know that the Arabs had a case. Did that. I want you to write what you told me. And I will publish it in my Temple David magazine. He was an editor of a reform synagogue, Jewish church. He said, you write this and I will publish it in my Temple David magazine. I said, Mr. Beer, I can't write. I'm not a writer. He said, I can easily talk anything. At the drop of a pin, I can get started. I can talk. But writing is an ordeal. He said, no, no, do that. You just write as you say, and I will improve it for you. And he meant it. He meant it. But I didn't reach that stage of writing what I had spoken. No. From next morning, I am Mr. D. Dad. He comes in to the shop and says, good morning, Mr. D. Dad. He goes for lunch and says, good afternoon, Mr. D. Dad. He goes out in the evening and says, good evening, Mr. D. Dad. D. Dad becomes Mr. D. Dad. No, no, no. Allah says, Min humul mu'minu. Now, among them, there are good people. Wa humul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. There are goodly people among them.